Um, thank you. Um, firstly, thank you very much. We've obviously been a keen watcher of this programme and supporter of the programme, having provided a lot of the inv initial investment. Um, and actually, I was personally connected to it a number of years ago, so it's really great to see where we're getting to. And as, um, as you said, Simon, I think just the rigour that it's coming out with mixing qualitative and quantitative data and really coming out with quite sharp big picture model um, priorities and being able to really drill down into what that means in different national contexts, making a really important contribution. Um, there's a couple of things that I want to say about um, why we are welcoming this, this data and this thinking at the moment. And then a couple of other things that I want to talk about, firstly in terms of where our thinking is in DFID at the moment around some of these issues or what we're grappling with, and also where the post-2015 process um, is playing out and some of the challenges with some of the recommendations that you're making um, are. So firstly, I think there are a couple of points on why, this, why we're finding this really useful to inform our own discussions in terms of the, the work. Firstly, is this nature of thinking about the different elements of poverty. So it's not just a static concept, but that it is a dynamic concept. Um, and that it's not just about escaping and moving out of, of chronic poverty, but it's about thinking about um, stopping impoverishment and people falling back in, but also that sustained exit and escape that, as a, as a framework, is a really important framework to, for us all to be grappling with as we look at what success looks like and what do we, when, when have we achieved what we're trying to achieve in any context, whether that's national, local or, or global. Um, and the second part of it is that a really um, sort of multidisciplinary and multifaceted um, understanding of what drives poverty and what chronic poverty means to people um, and the, therefore the framework of recommendations that comes out of that. So the combination of understanding assets and shocks power and inclusion and political settlements and social and political norms um, together and recognising the interplay between those is really important. And the framework that you've you know, evolved over the years with that being that combination of, of economic, the inclusive growth side um, with importance of jobs, et cetera, um, the social protection interventions, the education interventions and um, sector investments. And again, the, the social and political norms, that understanding why people and certain people will consistently be left in those poverty traps and in persistent poverty and unable to get out. So not just the recognition that they're there, but understanding why and what those barriers are that actually might mean that other shifts in the rest of those three areas and the opening up of opportunities, economic or social, might mean that some people still find it very difficult to be able to access those opportunities. So keeping those very much together is important. And particularly this time, I think, with the discussion around sustainable development um, and the sustainable development goals, bringing in the environmental side um, more. We have just been talking that, um, that conflict is potentially missing, although you talk about shocks um, there. But taking a broader understanding of stability and, and conflict would be an interesting other angle to take on this, I think. Um, so I think overall it's very much resonating with a lot of thinking that we're doing in DFID at the moment, obviously very much interrelated with the wider global thinking around post-2015 and where what does development look like, how do you achieve sustainable poverty reduction, how do you achieve a sustained exit from poverty for a country um, and, a, and a sustained exit from aid and development assistance within that context. Um, and what does it mean to eradicate extreme poverty through sustainable development? What are those big picture models? So having a model that, that looks at these interrelations with a particular group of those that you need to address to get to zero is a really important contribution, I think. And it really it helps us to sort of think through when we're, when we're looking at our sort of conceptual models and bringing those together. Obviously, we have a strong focus on a number of the different areas, and you've... Um, you've picked up on a range that we, we consciously invest in for the reasons that we've been talking about today. Um, so economic development is a clear um, policy priority for us um, with a recognised focus around not just high and sustained growth but also inclusive growth um, and inclusion of, of different groups um, within that uh, process of economic transformation. A clear focus and a long-standing investment and prioritisation of human development, including education, um, and a real grappling by our education team at the moment as to what does that look like to really drive these transformations um, that we're all wanting to see in terms of extreme poverty reduction, a real focus on learning and skills, um, a question how do we get beyond basic education? We've been a major donor, if not the major donor, in basic education for a long time. How do you get further than that? Um, and from a girls' and women's side, we talk a lot about how do you get into the next stage beyond, beyond basic education, where it really starts to make that transformational difference for intergenerational poverty transmission. Um, and clearly social protection has been recognised for a long time. We've been proud to be a donor that's been very behind uh, an investment in the uh, critical 
um, investments in in those instruments that are important both for tackling chronic poverty, but also as you're talking about that vulnerability um, to shocks, but also changes in life circumstances and in different people's abilities and, and personal circumstances. So it can address a range of, of different diff issues and drivers of extreme poverty. Um, fourthly, that obviously we, we do a lot of thinking sitting on the social development side, working very closely with governance and conflict colleagues, very clear thinking around political settlement, those importance of those political institutions and norms, um, and wanting very much to see um, political um, thinking to be to be driving some of some of this work and, and investing heavily in the research side of that as well as the investment side. And finally, obviously we're thinking a lot about how this relates to the environmental side as well, recognizing that it's not extreme poverty or sustainable development. It's not an either or situation. But it's very much looking at how climate change and how whether or not we live within our resources or, or the, the limits of uh, natural resources and how we can protect those are actually going to shape whether or not we can achieve extreme poverty um, eradication over the years. Um, so a range of priorities there, and I think that this helps us to, to think through with a particular lens on getting to zero, think through um, the, the different dimensions of, of those multi-sectoral sort of approaches. In terms of post-2015, I'm sure you've been told this before, um, that I think overall, given that there's a broad consensus around getting to zero and extreme, tackling extreme poverty within the discussions, I think, at the moment, I think one of the wider challenges that we're all going to be facing um, across the world as we engage in different working groups and, and the post-2015 pro um, process is how the whole adds up to actually deliver that outcome. Um, and I think one of the contributions that this work makes and that w we all make using it is thinking about how do you actually keep that goal in mind of getting to zero, of leaving no one behind, and what do all of the goals need to, to do to add up to to really get us there? And what does that leaving no one behind element mean as the goals progress and the thinking progresses? Um, how do we make sure that we keep that essence that was very much there in the high-level panel report about a goal is not achieved unless everybody is, is part of that and participating in that progress? Um, how do we keep that sort of running through um, and trying not to load it into one set of, of indicators or targets? I would say, if I was sitting on the data side, and one of my colleagues is here in the room, that I might be slightly daunted by your list of proposed targets and indicators. Um, and I think that we need to keep some of that real richness and complexity about how we understand and get much better at capturing poverty dynamics, um, but also recognize that the goals and the targets and the indicators will be a mobilizing set um, that need to capture the essence and may not get to quite the technical purity that, that we might like to see if we all had control over what we might want to, to test for various reasons. But overall, we really welcome the, the thinking as it moves forward and look forward to continuing to engage with you on it. Thanks, Jen. Were you surprised by this, what seemed to me quite a high number of 600 and odd million people still <laughs> living below $1.25 in 2030? And do you have a number that you use <laughs> in different? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I think, the, I think having the aspirational goal of getting to zero is an important goal that we need to get to. There are lots of numbers and that people are doing and lots of analysis going on. We use different numbers. Um, but I think the key point to, to really take away in terms of where the post-2015 is going is that keeping it on that aspirational goal and not getting bogged down into my method is better than your method or my numbers are more accurate than your numbers, um, but really being focused around what it's trying to achieve um, and keeping the essence of that getting to zero um, really at the heart of what we do. Very good. We might come back to that when, you see whether <laughs> when you I've left. Whether we can persuade you to be a bit <laughs> less diplomatic, I think. Thank you very much. Uh,